Hello, everyone. In the previous sessions, we talked about probability and different types of distributions. And from today, we are going to start talking about the fundamental topics related to statistics. First thing first, what is a statistic? In daily life, when we talk about it, it's like a football match. At the end of it, you see the table of a statistic. It's talking about the raw data, actually. When we talk about statistics as a science, those numbers just are uh, raw data. But statistic as a science means these steps that I showed you here especially when we talk about data analysis, which is the heart of the statistics. The whole goal of the statistics is to extract information from pile of data. Usually data are lots of values, and in order to analyze it, we need to summarize it and then run some tests in order to get useful information. So this is the basic definition of the statistics. Another way to define it is to take sample from population in order to predict the parameter of the population. So we will go through those uh, definitions as well. As you can see, these are exactly the steps that we are practicing together in your assignments. Some of you already submitted the third assignment, which is still regarding summarizing data, by the way. But starting from the fourth one, after hypothesis testing, we will do some data analysis and hypothesis testing as well. All right, so we should know about population and sample very well in order to understand about statistics. Uh, here you have the definitions. And uh, whenever we talk about population, it's regarding uh, predicting the parameters of it. So mean and variance of that population, for example, we call them parameters. We take a sample from it, and those uh, estimations that we have regarding parameters, we call them a statistic. And whenever we have estimations, we have hat on that special variable. We will see lots of uh, examples regarding that. For example, if you want to predict median of the population, then we will have median hat, M hat, something like that. So what's the goal here? What's happening? We will see in the next slides to understand what's uh, exactly happening in statistics. So we give you one simple example. Assume that I want to know about the average height of all students in Metro. Uh, let's say, for example, we have, I don't know exactly how many students we have in Metro Ankara and Metro NCC, but let's say, for example, we have 20,000 number of students. If I want to know about that information, either I should go through a database to see whether I have such data about height of students. If not, it will take lots of time to ask the students one by one, What's your height in order to get the average of that? Or maybe I need to hire some students to gather this information for me. Or I should just uh, have a questionnaire and uh, let them to give me this information on specific forms. In any case, we call this survey. It means that I want to find the mean of the population by asking all the elements inside this population. By the way, when I say population, it doesn't necessarily mean the number of people. It means that the number of that subject that we are interested in. For example, here we are talking about the height of the students, not the students themselves, and we call it population in the statistics. All right, so in that case, I need to take a survey in order to understand exactly what's the average uh, of the height of students in that population, and we call it a parameter. So it's time consuming. Sometimes it needs money in order to hire some people to gather that information. To avoid it, it's possible to take a sample and estimate the average height of students. Assume that I can take a, a one sample from one specific class, and we say, okay, this is our sample. But the important thing is that 
the sample methods that we should take in order to approximate it, uh, it's very important to know which one to take. Like we have different types of them, uh, like uh, simple random uh, sampling, we have clustering one, stratified one, but in this class, unfortunately, this is out of the scope, so we don't talk about it. But if you are interested, you can search for them to see which one is the appropriate approach for each topic. So let's uh, just uh, linger on this slide a little more because it's very important to understand it, uh, what, what's exactly happening here. As I said, we have a big population usually. We don't have all the information, especially about the parameters. Look at these notations, like we have mu, we have sigma, we have sigma power 2, and this is uh, the mean of population, this one is the standard deviation of population, and this one is variance of the population. And when we take a sample, we try to estimate these parameters because we don't usually have the information about them. So when we take the average of the sample, let's say I uh, just took uh, one class as a sample, and I calculated the average height of them. This is uh, not a very good uh, method to uh, have this sampling, but anyway, let's uh, say for simplifying the problem, I did that, just took a class, and I just uh, got the average of them. Okay, this is the point estimation of this uh, parameter. So mean of the sample, mean of the population. I'm trying to estimate this one by calculating mean of the sample. And the uh, standard deviation and variance of the sample, I show them with lowercase s. So from now on, it's very important to distinguish between sigma and s. So s is related to sample. This is a statistic, not a parameter. And uh, let's go through the next notation, which is the standard error of the estimation. This is normal. When I take a sample, it, from the class and find the average of the height of students, it's not necessarily the same uh, as the parameter that we really have. Assume that I know what's the value regarding mean of the population. If I compare my estimation with it, maybe I understand I have two centimeter error, and which this is totally normal when you have such point estimations. In order to make it better, Maybe we want to consider confidence interval, with which we will talk about later, not just one point as the estimation, but an interval as estimation. We can even say I'm 99% sure the parameter that I have for the population falls inside this interval. So this is more worthy to do such things. Now, uh, as we said, we have different sampling methods. There are some criteria to notice in them, like if this is biased or unbiased estimator that we are using. And uh, in order to define that, we should go through uh, standard errors, and we will talk about them later. So we have a term like uh, descriptive statistics. We are talking about central criteria like mean, median, to understand exactly what's going on in the center of our distribution, or some uh, some criteria are not central, like variance, standard deviation, or different ranges that we can define. They show how the data distributed around or about the mean or median or any central criteria that we have. All right, so uh, for calculations, when we talk about mean of the sample, we show it with x bar as we explained. I'll take a look at this one. We get the summation of all the data in our sample and divide it by lowercase n. This is not capital N. It means that this is the sample size. You're already familiar how to, we get the average, right? There are different types of getting average, but this one is the most common one that we get the summation of all of the data and divide it by the sample size. In order to show whether this as a point estimation is actually unbiased, we should prove that this case holds. It means that expected value of all, uh, expected value of my variable as estimator is equal to my parameter. This is a general format. Like x bar, 
expectation of x bar is equal to mu. Expectation of my sample mean is equal to the parameter, which is the mean of my population. In order to prove that, we should consider all possible estimations of the parameter and get the average of them. In uh, practice, it never happens because we don't have that information. But inside the book, you can see the proof that if this uh, condition holds, then, okay, we say this uh, estimation was unbiased. In case of uh, if we have biased estimations, we can calculate the expected value for the difference between the uh, statistic and the parameter of that population. All right, we have another term named consistency. It shows that if the sampling error converges to zero as the sample size increases, like going, for example, to infinity or very big value for n, then the estimator is called consistent. Take a look at this one. When we consider the difference between a population parameter and a sample statistic, if this is more than a very small number called epsilon, and this one, if the probability goes to zero, as we have very big sample size, then in that case, we say that uh, this estimator is consistent. All right, to calculate the sample variance, we should, like a population variance, we should decrease each data by the mean, and we should power it by two and get the summation. At the end, we should divide it by n minus one, not capital N. So for variance, we had this formula here. Instead of x bar, we had mu, and then we divide it by capital N. But here we have divided by n minus one. There's a reason for that, and the, there's a proof to show why this is the case to make it an unbiased estimator. And the other reason is regarding to the degree of freedom, which we will talk about it later. So pay attention to the notations like s power two because this is related to sample, not population. This is not sigma, this is s. This is not capital N, this is lowercase n because this is a sample size. This is x bar, it means that the mean of sample, not mean of population. So that slide, as we explained before, was very important. Now, what is mod? Mod, we can consider it again as a central criteria. It shows that what's the most frequency that you have inside your data set. Or better to say, which value is repeated the most in your data? What's the most frequent data in your data set? So, uh, this one can be helpful as well for us. And uh, I already show you, explain for you why this is important. And uh, later in some slide, I also compare some uh, central criteria for you so that you will see why these things are important. I also explained here how we can calculate them. All right, for median, uh, this is important because we can show what percentage of your data set is lower that specific value. But what percentage we are talking about? When we say about median, 50% of your data for sure is less than or equal this value. This is useful because for mean of the sample, when you calculate it, when you have an outlier, it means that the data which affects your uh, the whole data in order to calculate your mean uh, significantly. And when you just avoid that specific outlier, you can see how significant this difference is. So uh, when we talk about median, uh, it solves this problem because if we have outliers, this is just one uh, data, the datum. Or for example, we have several data which can be considered as outlier, but if we don't consider them in median, it doesn't matter that much because there are just uh, some number of data. But when we talk about mean, we consider the value as well. We will show you later in details why this is important. And uh, especially if I show you box plot and how we can detect these outliers 
scientifically, not just to say, okay, this one seems an outlier, so we just ignore that one. Like uh, one example to compare mean and median together. Like in normal distribution, we know that mean and median are equal. That's why this is a symmetric distribution. But in case if one of them is greater than the other, then we have such cases that they are skewed either to the right or to the left. You see, it seems like this one should be left skewed, but whenever we have such a trend, we call this one, which have uh, emptiness here, so this is right skewed, this one is left skewed. How to calculate mean to know exactly which value in our data we have, which has 50% of data less than or equal to it, or vice versa. 50% more than or equal to it. In order to calculate it, if your sample size is an odd number, so after you sort your data, the exact data in the middle is your median. And if in case we have an even number as your sample size, then we will have two numbers in the middle which we should calculate their mean or average in order to find your median. There are different types of approximations in such cases, and we will practice it inside this tutorial to see which approach we can take to make it more accurate. A quantile is a general format of median, we could say. Now we say only median cover 50% less than it or 50% more than it. But we can generalize it to any percentage that you like, not even percentage. You could say, for example, I need, uh, for example, five over 1,000 of my data to be less than this value. Quantile can cover it. In terms of percentage, we have percentile. And in terms of quartiles, we have quartile. So we have, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, quartile, I, we have quartile. So uh, in case we have uh, our segments divided into quarters, we have 25% of your data less than a value, or 50%, or 75% to divide in four segments. So we have Q1, Q2, and Q3, which we will talk about it in Bytes plot in details. So let's uh, practice it. What median means in terms of quartile, percentile, and quantile? Median is 0, uh, 0.5 quantile to exactly show which percentage, which amount of data we need it to be less than that value, half of it, OK? Then 15th percentile, it means that 50% of data is less than that. And second quartile, quartile one, quartile two, quartile three. Second one is 50%. You see, we should uh, remember these three, uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, as quartiles, which are very important. All right, these are some important notations for you. You can go through them carefully. And as you can see, when you, whenever we put hat, it means that we want to estimate them. Interquartile range is a kind of range which is very helpful for us in order to detect the uh, outliers. So when we want to calculate it, this is actually the absolute value of the difference between Q1 and Q3. So we have an absolute value of those because this is a negative number which we don't want. Uh, we should make it positive. Or you can write Q3 minus Q1, which is always positive anyway. So this one we call uh, interquartile range IQR. And in order to detect our outliers, uh, we can use this formula. If you can find any data which is 1.5, uh, I mean less than 1.5 multiply IQR, then in that case, you can say this data is an outlier. And we should also consider Q1 inside this formula, which I will show you the exact formula later. But I just wanted to show you here that there is a one multiplication to IQR, which makes it easy for us to detect them. And this 1.5 that we have here, this is not fixed. We can change it uh, based on our taste. But usually, in most of the books, you can see this number. We will practice it together to show you uh, why sometimes I need to change it in some uh, problems. Otherwise, it's worthless to, uh, it's not uh, worth it to do uh, 1.5 for some cases. Okay, about the data types, 
we already talked about it twice uh, inside the lecture, but let me once more go through it very fast. Uh, this is very important to know the differences between these types. Uh, as you saw in the assignments, uh, if we understand them correctly, then it makes our job much easier in order to summarize our data. So uh, what was nominal data type? Uh, it was a kind of data type that we couldn't compare them together, like a male and female. We cannot say, for example, male is better than female or vice versa, or otherwise we get in trouble, right? So we cannot say that. Or group one or group and group two. I cannot compare them with, without having extra information. So these data types as their own, they are nominal data types. When we talk about ordinal, there's a type of comparison like for example, comparing good with bad. I know that uh, good is better than bad, so we can compare it. Uh, but uh, I cannot say how much is better than bad. So in that case, uh, we have a uh, disadvantage in opening our data type. But for interval and ratio, we can have such comparison. What is, what is an interval data type? Uh, for the interval one, we can compare them by saying, for example, this value is bigger than this one by two units, but I cannot say it is twice bigger. Let me give you an example, like weather temperature. The zero is relative here. Like yesterday was two degrees and today was four degrees. So if I compare them together, I could say today was warmer by two centigrades, for example. But I cannot say it was twice warmer. Like uh, if it was, for example, zero centigrade today and tomorrow will be four centigrade, I cannot say tomorrow was four times warmer than today. It doesn't have any meaning. So this zero here is relative. But when we talk about ratio, we solve this problem like uh, kilograms. For example, you want to compare two people with one another. One person is 60 kilograms, the other one is 120 kilograms. Uh, so the other guy is uh, twice heavier than the other one. We can say 60 kilogram uh, is, is for 60 kilogram is heavier and also twice heavier. This is possible to have such uh, multiplication operations here as well. So you can see the differences here as we also described in the class. All right. So the best way and easiest way we could say for summarizing your data is using plots. Obviously, we could use those central criteria as well, which are very useful too. But these things show the distributions inside your data much easier. And in order to share it with other scientists or to share it with your colleagues, uh, also you can see in lots of companies, they all the time show or illustrate graphs because it's the easiest way to summarize data. So we have different types of them. I showed you that uh, which one, for example, is appropriate for which type of data, but it's not uh, necessarily like that. In some cases, based on uh, your study, you can see you can even uh, use them for uh, different types of data as well. But these are my suggestions that uh, you can use. These are the ones that uh, I selected. There are lots of them because these ones are the most frequent ones that we are using. Like, for example, pie chart is perfect for showing the frequency, the relative frequency for uh, nominal types. And uh, we can calculate it by finding <coughs> the angle for each one of these. Uh, uh, data or for example if you have blue segment okay 20 percent of that it means that we should find a specific angle for that circle which totally has 360 degree in order to find the specific angle to draw it but when you are using software you don't even need to know about those angles anyway like bar chart is perfect for showing the frequency of your uh, data for example, you can compare different social medias in a specific characteristics. Like to say, for example, for Facebook, when I compare it to Twitter, this one was more frequent in terms of percentage. 
you can even define them as a relative frequency. Or histogram, which is very good for showing uh, the information regarding, I mean, uh, summarize your data regarding uh, ratio or interval data types, because you can see they are connected to one another. It's not like bar chart when this is uh, useful usually for nominal or sometimes ordinal. Stem and leap also is one of those famous charts, which in practice we don't honestly use it that much. And this is good for ordinal, like uh, an interval, a data type, like for example, weather temperature, to show your data, to summarize your data like this. Like this one means nine, this one means 15, 19, 22, 24, 25. Instead of listing all of the values, you can show them like this. This is easier to find the mode here or median. And uh, this is the one way to show, but usually since we are dealing with pile of data, this graph is not my favorite either. All right, scattered diagram is very famous for showing correlation between, uh, for example, two variables because to show for three or more uh, it doesn't look that much good uh, on your graph okay this one for example shows no correlation this one is pretty low this one is high correlation this one is perfect it means that they are really related to one another it's like a line and uh, when we have such high correlations we have different types of them like if this is positive this is the trend if this is negative this is this way. It doesn't show, for example, if it goes down, it doesn't have high uh, correlation. It is just negative. It's like if uh, your height, for example, is increasing, your weight is increasing as well. This is a positive correlation. Or in case if we have negative correlations, uh, then we have such a case like this. It means that one variable is increasing, the other one is decreasing. Or they have a nonlinear relation like this. Or partially, they were related suddenly from a point. They are not related that much. They don't have that much correlation. OK, this one we will practice uh, during tutorial for sure. And uh, just to go through it very fast, uh, here you can see first we can mention uh, about our median inside our box. And uh, this is our Q1 and Q3, which we can calculate easily. And these are our tails of our box. We call it whisker and box plot. And uh, not always we consider the whole range like this, like maximum and minimum of your data. Sometimes in order to show the outliers, I can uh, decrease the length of the tails. And for example, here maybe it will be ended, so this data will be outlier. I will show you in detail uh, inside the next uh, tutorial. And IQR is very important to check because of showing those outliers. In this case, since we consider minimum and maximum, so it doesn't show any outliers anyway. Time, time plots are very useful, especially when we talk about time series. It's very interesting to know about this graph. It shows the trend of a variable based on time. And we can predict future by knowing your previous data. For example, if I know about the information about yesterday, maybe I can predict tomorrow. Like until here, assume that it was yesterday or maybe today. Now we want to predict tomorrow. Okay, From here, maybe I can predict this trend. But it's not that easy. For example, in this graph, maybe it has seasonal trend. Uh, unfortunately, this is out of the scope of this book. Uh, we won't talk about them in detail, just to know um, it's very important in research to know about time plots, especially time series graphs. I already missed our classes together. And uh, it's very important that uh, during this time to uh, follow the health issues, but obviously don't cra go crazy with it because uh, our the health of our mind is important as well. Let's try to have balance in your life beside your university task, it, uh, it's nice to have fun as well, as much as uh, possible. I try to manage your time in order to have a sort of balance in your life. Okay, guys, see you very soon.